I don't know what about you. Sounds like I can't hold a job, doesn't it? So anyway, so. And I am a little batty. We have an old historic barn that I just basically gave over to the uh, Mexican free tail bats. So uh, it's built in 1900, and if you know anything about Mexican free tail bats, they're pretty smart. They uh, come and raise their young in uh, uh, New Mexico, where I live, in southern New Mexico. And then when it gets cold, they leave and go winter in Mexico. Pretty smart, but they're territorial, so they're migratory, so they come back. And so, and the bat people tell me that if you want to keep them out of your barn, they, uh, they can get through a circle the size of a dime. So uh, I have a barn that I wanted as a barn, and it now is a bat barn. Because there's no way in hell you're going to take a, an adobe barn that was built in 1900 and bat-proof it. So, so now we got a whole bunch of cats living in it, too. And uh, I'm just weird as hell, folks. So what can I tell you? It is good to come home, though. I spent three wonderful years in Ames uh, in uh, the graduate program there. And it was a wonderful experience. It's good to come home. And it was good that so many of you came up and reminisced, former students. And some of you traveled a long way to say hello. And I do appreciate it. It's just fun to be there. And those of you that know me well know I'm just weird beyond words. So let me uh, let me get started. I, I guess I'm old enough to basically tell you that uh, when you get to be, I just turned 68, uh, you don't have to read history anymore. Hell, you are history. Uh, you know, and the good thing about that, though, is it gives you a frame of reference. And so I want to try to give you a frame of reference. Why I truly, and I, and I say this sincerely, think it's the best time ever to be in agriculture. I truly, I say that. I'm going to try to convince you of that. And I'm not trying to make light of some of you that are trying to make cash flow and and don't like the current prices. I'm not trying to make light of that, but I want to try to tell you from a historical perspective, and at least from the 50,000 foot level, I think it's not only the best time to be in agriculture, health folks, I think it's the best time to be alive. Okay. I do. I just think it, when you, when you study frames of references of times and what people have had to go through, uh, it's a good, it's the best time to be alive, and it's the best time to be in agriculture. And I want to start first with one little twist, and I'll give you the reference on it, because when I tell you this, you may not uh, uh, believe it, but let me explain to you. I do not use PowerPoint. Those of you who know me know I don't, so let me explain my long arms to you, okay? Up, down, plumb weird as hell, okay? Okay, okay. So let me start with this one, and I'll give you the reference. This one was in the New York Magazine, written by a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Chat, uh, September issue, Okay. And this was right before the Paris Accord on climate change uh, in the fall of 2015. Okay? And it was a, an article that essentially said, this is the sunniest article on climate change that you'll read. And his point was this. Okay? The world in 2014 had its largest output ever. The largest output ever in history. The world produced 72 trillion bucks. Okay, up two trillion from the previous year. Okay, largest output ever, 72 trillion. And for the first time in keeping records, carbon emissions were flat. Actually, they were down one tenth of one percent, but everybody reported it flat. Actually, they were down 11 percent in the United States. Okay, first time ever that we had output up and carbon emissions were down. Okay. And the record then, and everybody said, well, that was just a fluke. But when we updated the numbers for 2015, it comes out that it was down then another 2.8%. Okay. Are you with me, folks? We've never had a period when we've had economic output up and carbon emissions fall. Okay. His take on it was this. We went from 523 coal-fired power generating facilities 10 years ago to 323. We lost 200 of them. They switched to natural gas, which emits less carbon into the environment than coal plants generally do. But I'm not arguing with that. We did. Those are numbers are facts. Okay, we did. We, we, we switched that many plants. But uh, we also know that in 2014, we celebrated 21 years in the United States where we planted more trees by number and by acre than we harvested. Wait a minute. Mother Nature sequesters carbon where? Takes it in stores and puts it away in her oceans and in her plants. I'll be go to hell. Wait a minute. We celebrated 21 years where we planted more trees by number and by acre in the United States than we harvested, and the world in 2014 celebrated its 10th year where we planted more trees by number and by acre than we harvested. And then somebody said, well, yeah, Brazil cut down three million. Yeah, and nobody counted the fact that China in 2014 planted 5.1 million more acres 
of forests than they harvested, and India planted another 5 million. You with me, folks? We planted more trees by number and by acre worldwide for 10 years, 21 years here, than we harvested. I think that's a pretty good thing, okay? Gee, that couldn't have contributed to it, do you think? Just see, now see, now, 40 west, I mean, east of the Mississippi, 60% of all the acres of trees are controlled by farmers, 20% by large paper companies and other public entities, but 80% in private hands. And we planted more trees by number and by acre. Gee, you contributed to that. And west of the Mississippi, where we exploded the first atomic bomb in New Mexico for a reason, it did $2 million worth of improvement, okay? <laughs> There's not much out there, okay? Okay? It's kind of wide open spaces, but 40% of the forest and tree acres west of the Mississippi are in private hands as well, okay? Gee, that couldn't have contributed to carbon sequestration, don't you think? But more important to you at home is this, and you know this, we do prescription agriculture now. Not precision. Precision is just using the best technology. Agriculture's always done that, okay? I don't care what it was, just a new type of a harness on a, on a horse. We've always done precision uh, agriculture. This is prescription agriculture for that farm. No, it's not for just that farm. It's for now every linear inch because those of you that also plant corn and soybeans know what? That planter does what? Every linear inch it's doing what? Determining how many corn plants, how many soybean plants go in that linear inch. And the new one now can allow for three different hybrids or three different varieties. So every linear Linear inch now does what? We determine the number of seeds and the kind of seeds for that linear inch, that prescription agriculture, and we can prove it. That sequesters eight times more carbon than Mother Nature can by what she puts on the ground. And if you have a healthy soil microbe profile, it adds another 8x. Are you with me, folks? In a carbon-rich world, you know who owns it and controls it? It's called agriculture. Okay, okay, okay. Because the way we're going to sequester carbon, see, all we can do with carbon right now, it is a carbon neutral world, and I'm not making an issue over climate change or anything else. I don't give a rip about it. I give a rip, we got a bunch of carbon. And guess what? We can either have them emit less carbon, or we can do what? Take it away. And the only people that can take it away and sequester it are the people that control plants, and that's you. So get ready, because in a few years, you're going to have to make some interesting policy things because the Australians gave us the, the, the model on it. It's called ecological service fee payments, and they can do it right now. You prove that you've sequestered this much carbon and cleaned up the atmosphere, guess what? We as Australians will make a concerted effort to pay you an ecological service fee for doing so. Get ready, folks. Ten years ago, we didn't talk about carbon. In 10 years, we may be talking about ecological service fee payments, and the people that are entitled to them are you. Okay. One more little final thing, and this has nothing to do with the best time to be in agriculture, uh, but I just find it interesting as hell. Okay. Okay. And it is this. Okay. The average new car today, driving down the road at 65 miles an hour, emits fewer harmful things into the environment than the average car sitting dead in the parking lot of 1970. What? That can't be. A car driving 65 miles an hour does fewer harmful things to the environment than a car sitting dead in the parking lot of 1970. Folks, I'm old enough to remember what a car of 1970 did sitting in the parking lot. Trust me, go back and read some of the press at the time. We had just started this novel idea called self-service. Anybody remember that? Oh, my God, go back and read some of the press on it. Oh, we, this is a very volatile chemical gasoline. We can't allow people to just pull up there and put the gasoline in it themselves. It's very volatile. We need somebody that didn't graduate from high school to come out and do it for you. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, you can't do self-service. Okay. And guess what? We did, didn't we? We sucked it up like a sponge. So that car of 1970 sitting dead in the parking lot, we had long since left the gas cap on some pump somewhere, so it had a red shop rag sticking out the filler pipe probably, okay? And if it didn't still have the original cap on it, guess what? It wasn't captive return of the gasoline vapor. So I guarantee you that car of 1970 with the gas cap on it or not didn't matter. What was happening to those gasoline vapors? Where were they going? Into the atmosphere. Look under the automatic transmission. Guarantee you what? Puddle of oil, guarantee. This is 1970, folks. Come on. Okay. 
under the engine, probably a little oil spill, probably some antifreeze. You with me, folks? One of the first jokes you learn if you drive a British sports car like I do is the reason the Brits could never make color television sets. They couldn't figure out how to make them drip oil. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Because I guarantee you, you got a car in 1970, you can overhaul it and put new seals in it, and I guarantee you, the day you park it, what? Average new car today, 65 miles an hour, harm, less harmful to the environment than one sitting dead. Okay. Oh, and one more thing, too. Okay. My 1971 MGB, I don't want to get it in anymore. Doesn't have any safety belts. Doesn't have passive retraint. 1970, ladies and gentlemen, if you're my generation baby boomer, then we have, our war was Vietnam. And if you go to Washington, D.C., and I, I can't go to Washington, D.C. without walking up to that Vietnam Memorial, uh, and as I walk up and you see all those names start popping out, it makes that war very real. And to date, there's 58,219 names on that wall. But in 1970, we kill 57,000 Americans on our highways. We killed ever, as many people in cars as the Vietnam War did. That car of 1970, in addition to being not real good for the environment, uh, it was a death trap. I remember when seat belts were first mandatory, my late father said, Oh, hell, I'd rather just be thrown out of the pickup. <laughs> Well, I had two, but not at 70 miles an hour, <laughs> okay? And before he passed away in 1991, I can remember him getting in the car and reaching for that passive restraint. Huh. Saying, gosh, I feel naked now without it, okay? We drive 40% more miles today than we did in 1970. And instead now of 57,000 people dying on our highways every year, 32,000 die. And what's the trend? I don't know about you, I kind of like airbags, kind of like passive restraints. What I'm really trying to tell you is the good old days, they sucked. <laughs> okay, okay. They weren't real good for many reasons. Best time ever to be in agriculture, okay? Got some fabulous things going on. So let me give, try to frame it for really the, the first trend that matters the most to us, and not only agriculture, but in, in so many things it doesn't matter, is go back to 1970. I like it for many reasons. The reason I like it is not just for that car sitting in the parking lot, but 1970 was the year the United States became the world's first $1 trillion economy. Okay? The world at that time produced slightly less than $4 trillion, Okay, We became the world's first. If you do the math, we were about what? 25% of the world's output. Okay, Second largest economy in the world in 1970 was the UK at about $250 billion. China, India, Brazil with half the world's population, 3.6 billion people. Okay, that was the world's population, and they had half of them. Okay, they produced slightly less, all of them combined, with half the world's population, than what the UK did, with 30 million people. Okay, and we said in economics in 1970, my gosh, if we could just get the Chinese to buy one more pair of shoes, we wouldn't have a shoe problem. Okay, it's true. He said, guess what? They ain't had no money. But suddenly in 1970, not suddenly, but gradually you start looking at incomes and what started happening. Second largest economy now, let's go to 2014, I'll update you for 2015, but go for 2014, the world's output was how much? 72 trillion, okay? The United States celebrating becoming the world's first 18 trillion dollar economy. Did you do the math? We were still about what? I would go to hell? One fourth, huh? Oh, oh, we go to hell. Okay, okay. The world grew, and it grew dramatically. Population of the world grew too. 7.2 billion people in 2014 did double. But what's interesting is in agriculture, in 1970, you need 2,450 calories on average. The average human being does for daily maintenance. Men need a little bit more. Women need a little bit less. If you're a teenager, you need about 10,000. But you need on average about 2,450. <laughs> We could not, in agriculture, in the world, provide 2,450 calories for 3.6 billion people. Oh, we did quite nicely here in the United States and in a few countries, but guess what? The world did not have 2,450 calories 
And so we mimicked what Jonathan Swift told us in the late 1600s. He said, we should applaud and reward those people who can grow two blades of grass where one grew before. And I guarantee you the Iowa states, the New Mexico states, all of our land-grant colleges and universities, all of our universities indeed, tried to grow two blades of grass where one grew before because we could not feed a hungry world. That was 1970. And in 2014, the world's output did what? 72 trillion. The world's population did double. And we produced, now guess what? 3,100 calories for every man, woman, and child. You need 2,450. So what's the press say to us in agriculture? The world's going to do what? Oh, maybe go to 9 billion. That's forecast. We have no idea whether it will or not. We go to 9 billion May. I don't know. It's forecast. Doesn't matter. But guess what? Can we feed 9 billion people? Hell, we already do. If you only eat 2,450, which is what you need, and we're producing 31, 3,200 calories, guess what? We can already feed 9 billion people. Now, I don't know about you. I really need to go to 2,450, but damn, it's hard. Okay? So I probably won't. But to say we cannot, agriculture cannot feed 9 billion people is the biggest lie on the planet because guess what? We already do. And here's the most interesting thing too. In the United States, we provide the supple and fiddle feed and habitat to protect another 10 billion head of wildlife and feed our animals the best diet ever on the planet. And I guarantee you, we say in animal agriculture, our animals have the best life ever. They just have one really bad day. Okay. But that's true for all of us humans, too, is it not? And so I ran the numbers, and I ran them myself, and then I looked around, and so these are my numbers, but there are also some people that have thought very good about this, because we have an expression. If you steal from one source, it's plagiarism. If you steal from many, it's called research. So I did my research on this, okay? <laughs> And if we take the technology of agriculture of 1970 and we do today what we can do for us, for those 7.2 billion people, we need the arable land mass of Canada, the United States, and China combined to produce the same level that we do today. Three billion acres that we do not have to farm. So guess what we can do on those three billion acres? You can have some ducks and some wildlife. And you know this, we have the large, we have 100 times more deer in America than 100 years ago. Some of you probably dodged to get into this conference, okay? We have ten times more elk. Are you with me, folks? You in agriculture not only feed the world better than it's ever been fed in the history, you feed and provide the supplemental habitat for the best diet ever for all of those animals. And we have more dogs today, more horses. We have more horses today than when we were a horse-powered society. You understand? I, what? We have more horses than when they used to pull us and our freight up and down the roads. Hell, we pull them up and down the roads now. The average horse is ridden twice a year. They don't do jack. <laughs> what a fabulous thing agriculture's done. Best time ever to be in agriculture. Not only because we feed more people better than at any time on the planet. All of the wildlife and all of the trees and all the forests now have a way to do what? That's why it's the best time ever to be alive. And underpinning it all was you adopting phenomenal technologies so that we could do that, so that three billion acres could be done with something else. Fabulous time to be in agriculture. Best time ever to be in agriculture. Okay? So here we come, folks. We have now this, and this is, this is the most interesting thing. Finally, The Economist magazine had a positive graph on its cover, and it was a down graph. Uh, it's so rare to see that. I stayed drunk for three days when I saw this positive thing. Okay? And it was this, the number of people in the world that lived in abject poverty 10 years ago stood at 2 billion. That's less than a dollar and 25 cents a day. It's fallen to 750 million. Okay. Still too many, but guess what? 
That's the fastest drop ever. Smallest percentage of people in the world that live in abject poverty ever in recorded history. Okay? The world's getting more money. And as the world gets more money, what do they want? I ran the numbers for the heating and air conditioning folks for China. Seven-fold increase in window air conditioning units went to China in the last five years. Chinese got enough money, they basically said, hell, we're tired of being hot. <laughs> okay, okay. No wrong or right, it's just guess what? They want things just like we do. Okay? More cars, better diets. And the first thing they want to change in their diet is to what? Meat protein. You've seen it, you've read about it, but folks, I come by to tell you this. If I run the numbers both ways, if we go to nine billion, that's a forecast? I don't know that we will. Because the best birth control on the planet is what? Someone yelled out the other day, personality, but that's truly <laughs> <laughs> and that may be true, okay? <laughs> but the best birth control on the planet is money. It is culturally neutral. People get more money, what do they do? They quit having kids, okay? And so guess what? The world is now richer than at any time in history, so what's happening to the birth rate worldwide? It's just falling off to damn near nothing. Most developed nations can't reproduce themselves and don't, okay? It's falling off to nothing. So I don't know if it's going to go to like 9 billion. So I do it two ways. I just take the income effect alone. Just on the income effect alone, we are getting wealthier in the world, phenomenally so. So it's just the income effect alone. Guess what? To meet that, we have to do 50% increase in meat protein in the next 20 years. If the world's population goes to 9 billion, we've got a 2x meat. Got a 2x meat protein. No question. Got to double it. Well, guess what, folks? It is not going to come from pastoral agriculture. Okay? And I'm not making light of pastoral agriculture. In fact, I'll come back and tell you how to make some money in pastoral agriculture. Pastoral agriculture to me is, well, I want to see those cows grazing on the green grass. They're pretty. They are. Okay? It can't feed a hungry world. Okay? Okay? Can't give them 2x meat. Folks, listen with geneticists. Using the best drone technology for remote sensing of animal health, the best we can come up with is we can provide 20% in open pasture systems. That's it. So where's it going to come from? It's going to come from intensive animal operations. And you know that. Because we can prove so many things about intensive animal operations, which are most of you in this room. And please understand, I'm not talking about making light of open pasture systems. I'll come back and tell you how to make money on them, okay? Because you probably already are, okay? But on those intensive animal operations, you know this. Guess what? We can prove that we use fewer inputs to get what? A given level of output. We can prove that, okay? Come on, I'm old enough to remember the first feeds and feeding class. Three pounds of, of grain to get what? A pound of pork. Come on, the best of you now are doing what? Half that, 1.5, that's poultry. Come on. So we have the smallest number of inputs to get a given level of output. That's the best. We can prove it has the smallest negative impact to the environment. And their overall physical health is what? So we're going to do it in intensive animal operations. And where are those going to be? Here. We got the infrastructure. We got the grains because intensive animal operations require what? It's not just the best time to be in meat, but guess what? If they're intensive animal operations, they're having to eat what? Some Iowa corn, some Iowa soybeans. And, are you with me? Okay. Best time ever. Okay. So we're going to do that, and most of them are going to be where the infrastructure is. Gee, is it any wonder that the Chinese want so much of our pork facilities? Okay. I'm not telling you that we're not going to have intensive animal operations grow worldwide. I'm telling you the vast majority of supplying a 2x meat for the next 20 years is going to come from intensive animal operations primarily in the United States. And if North Carolina doesn't want to do it, Iowa will. And if you decide in Iowa you don't want to do it, Texas will. We've got 50 states. So get ready, folks. 2x meat, folks. And you know it better than anybody. You produce half of the damn pork of the whole nation damn near here in Iowa. So you understand it. I'm not picking on you. I'm just trying to tell you, guess what? That's going to grow. Okay? Okay? Fabulous time to be in agriculture. Not only for meat, because the world's got more money. So one more little final. This is my final PowerPoint to you. Okay? 
And if you got it in high school, maybe some of you got it in college. Anybody remember a guy by the name of Abraham Maslow? He talked about Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. I remember the first time I heard that thinking, is this crap going to be on the test? What a bunch of nonsense. Okay. Okay. Oh, people go through stages in their life. Whoopee. That's French for who cares. Okay. Okay. But old Maslow proved to be pretty smart because Maslow said what? At the very base, what? Humans are going to satisfy. It's culturally neutral. Everybody does it. People are going to supply what? Their basic needs, right? Food, clothing, and shelter. You've got food in your belly. Somebody's not stealing it from you. You're safe from the... You... This is where my parents' generation grew up. My mom will turn 90. She still lives on a ranch in the Panhandle of Texas. She still saves aluminum foil. <laughs> no wrong or right. That's where she grew up, okay? But Maslow was pretty smart because he said if you could get beyond that, what? What would be the next layer? Love and acceptance. Find somebody to share it with. And then find at the top you would what? Self-actualize. Find yourself. Okay. As the world's got more money and moving out of here, they're moving to where? Love and acceptance. Hmm. What's the old saying? I wish I was half the man my dog thinks I am. <laughs> what do you think has happened to the number of dogs in China? Cats. Seventy-nine percent of us greet our pet first when we come home. Nineteen percent greet our spouse first. As my wife told me, if you lick my face the way the dog does, I'd greet you first too, Lowell. So. <laughs> What I'm trying to tell you is you think Perrine is going to sell some dog chow into China. Kind of. Okay. What's their pet population going to do worldwide? Just like ours. Just like a nut that leaves an old adobe barn to a bunch of damn bats. Because here comes the other one. Here's where you make money off of this. Because as the world's getting more money to buy the basics and move up, the richer world, because in 1970, folks, this was the case, okay? We spent how much of our disposable income to eat in the United States? 20%. How many meals did you eat away from home? 1970. Once a week, okay? 20% just to eat. The world was spending 60%. Fast forward to today, what is it? Smallest it's ever been in history, 10%. And if you want to split hairs, 9.7. Official last number from the USDA, 9, 10, 9.7. 10%. You understand? Agriculture's efficiency gave back to the Ameri average American. You didn't have to get an increase in your salary since 1970. You didn't have to do jack in this society. And agriculture's efficiency gave you back 10% of your income. Because you used to have to spend 20%, now you spend 10%. You didn't have to do jack, and suddenly you got 10% more. Okay? And the world went from 60% to 40%. Are you with me, folks? Guess what? Because here comes when people spend nothing on food. In 1970, how many craft breweries did we have in the United States? <laughs> Zero, not a none! Budweiser, shut up! Okay? Or Grain Belt. I remember drinking a lot of Grain Belt at Iowa State because it was like 30 cents a case. Okay. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> One of the essential food groups. Bacon, bourbon, and beer. The three. You can live on it damn near, can't you? Okay. Okay. How many craft breweries do we have today? 4,000 last count. And we had about five a week. I don't want Budweiser, I want Moose Drool. Could it be organic? Okay. Okay. We have the most critical shortage of hops ever in history. Come on, any of you growing some hops? You should, it's a weed. Okay. 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 Most critical, I don't know about you, the last craft beer I had, it had so much hops in it, it took three Coors Lights to get the damn taste out of my mouth. Okay? Okay. Hmm. And now it used to be just bourbon from Kentucky, but what? what is it today? 
Come on, you got micro distilleries now in Iowa. What? Iowa bourbon. North Dakota rum. Everybody has distilleries now producing bourbon. Have you seen the latest one, organic vodka? You can't make this stuff up. You can't. I met the lady that's selling it, and I go, organic, like 90 proof going to kill every damn thing in the bottle. She goes, Lord, you can tease me all day long, but I'm, I'm pushing the production people. I can sell ten times more than I can get. I go, who in the hell buys organic vodka? And her comment was, usually people that go to spas. <laughs> As I told you, my mom will turn 90 in May. She still lives on a ranch, and I guarantee she's probably doing today what people in January are doing. If they live on a ranch, they're probably out breaking ice so the cattle can get water. I don't think she's ever been to a spa. Okay. I'm not making light of that. I'm telling you spas are just like now when we spend 10% to eat. Guess what? How many meals do you eat away from home? One out of every two. Gee, is it any wonder since 1970 what's happened to the growth of restaurants, Starbucks? Okay. Hmm. I want free-range chickens. I grew up on a ranch. We had free-range chickens. You know what we called them? The neighbors. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 And now have you seen the latest one? Slow-growth chickens. I, as I said, you can't make this crap up, okay? I guess there's enough people that say that they can tell the difference between the muscle of a chicken that grows slowly versus one that goes rapidly. I don't know, but somebody's buying them. Okay. Slow pigs? Used to call them roadkill, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making light of it. I'm just trying to tell you, guess what? If I showed up on your farm in 1970, who grows corn here? Who's a corn farmer? If I showed up on your farm in 1970, oh, hell, you're too damn young. You wouldn't even live in 1970. But in any event, if I showed up on your farm in 1970 and said, I want to buy 10 acres of it, and I want, what do you want to do? You bought the silk stage. What are you going to do with it? I want to plow it down. What? You want to plow it down? But I, want, I don't want the 10 acres in the corner. I want to plow it down randomly so that from 50,000 feet it'll look like a Darth Vader's mask. What would you have said to me? What in the hell are you talking about? And I'll say, well, I'm going to call it a corn maze. And you charge five bucks for people to go in it. They're going to get lost. You charge 15 bucks to extract them. Okay? 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 Folks, when... When people asked if they could hunt deer or pheasant or quail on my late father's ranch where I grew up, his comment to him always was, just make sure you shut the gate. And do you know what a cow looks like? <laughs> okay. But ecotourism in the form of corn mazes, hunting leases, whether it's for killing them or just taking a picture of them, is now fully 10% of net farm income in the United States. One of the largest crops that New Mexico people harvest are Texans. <laughs> we don't have any mountains, so they want to come and pay 10000 bucks to get a trophy elk, and they're more than happy to supply it to them. Okay? It's not wrong or right. It's just, guess what? Ecotourism wasn't on the cards. Best time ever to be in agriculture, okay? Because you now have the most differentiated, segmented markets. If somebody wants organic-grown pigs... Slow pigs, side by side, you can help feed a hungry world, which you've done, and you can also do what? Come on, folks. Side by side, you can have the multitude of markets that never existed before. Best time ever to be in agriculture because you got choice now, because guess what? People got money, and they're weird as hell. Okay? <laughs> so harvest them, okay? But let me leave you with the trends that I think you really that I just find exciting, that just 
Oh, gosh, I just love it, okay? And let me start first with, with the, which is really the subset of the next four trends I want to leave you with real quickly, okay? And it takes from taking this riser. It's about the size of this riser, a little bit shorter, a little bit narrower, and about a foot in depth, okay? If you can imagine a rectangle about like that, okay? That was a computer system that we used on the Apollo program that safely took 12 men to the moon and brought them home, okay? First one to land on the moon in July of 1969 and walk on the moon was Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, okay? Uh, we since lost uh, Neil. He passed away. Buzz is still alive, thankfully. But then we subsequently, then the last man to walk on the moon who just died on Martin Luther King Day was Gene Cernan. He didn't know that he was the last man to walk on the moon. The last two men was Harrison Smith in Apollo 17, and Gene Cernan was the last man to put his footprint on the moon in December of 1972. That was a computer. Took 12 men to the moon, safely brought them home. Count Apollo 13, it took them there and safely brought them back with a lot of smart engineering, okay? Didn't take a lady and land on the moon and walk on it, but got them home, okay? That was a computer, okay? My galaxy. It's not a seven, so you don't have to back up, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Hmm. My galaxy is 32 million times more powerful than that computer. I don't know about you. I, I can't phantom that number. That was a pretty damn good computer. And this is 32 million times more powerful? <gasps> what I'm trying to tell you is for all intents and purposes, computer capacity is infinite, okay? And its speed is infinite. We've never had that in history. Throughout all of history, we've always done what? It's been very precious, been very costly, okay? We're limited by how much computer capacity. Gone. For all intents and purposes, the computer capacity and speed is infinite. In an infinite computer world, get ready, it blows the doors off of every single field on the planet, okay? And the first one to get, uh, get it right on aware of is one we, the fancy AI people like to call it cognition, okay? I like to just say they get smart and they can talk to each other, okay? Cognition basically says what? We're going to have devices that do what? Communicate with each other. One of the early ones was what? You had this app for 20 years, okay? We didn't know app was a, we didn't coin that word app 20 years ago, but you had a program for your, com your phone, your portable mobile phone, that you could change the thermostat in your home, okay? We've had that 20 years, actually, okay? And it basically, I mean, can anybody in here do this? I got it early on, and then I go, why? I'm in Des Moines, and my wife's in Messina, New Mexico, and if I change the thermostat, she's going to kick my ass. <laughs> so it, it was one of those that, nice, but what? <laughs> So what? You know, okay. Well, here comes cognition. And here, Kevin Kelly, who was one of the former managing editors of Wired Magazine, this, this is the number that you should take home with you and stagger your imagination, not so much 32 million. He said in 2015 that we put transistors in things other than computers in this amount. Five quintillion. I don't know about you. I had to look up the damn. What is a quintillion? It's a million trillion. Well, that helps a hell of a lot. Five quintillion. It's like 32 million. So I tried to do a thought experiment. So I took U.S. currency, dollars, taped them together, measured them a little bit, Okay, and then I had to measure the thickness because these are pretty thin. Actually, I Googled it. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> isn't that interesting? You know you've made it when a noun becomes a verb. Okay, Googled it. Come on, my generation used to make some bar money, you know, and get a free beer bought to us if we had to, if we could remember things. Who was the second baseman for the Chicago Cubs in 1972? If you could remember that crap, you could get a beer. Now the next generation does what? Well, they Google it. Before I can even get it out, they've already Googled it. Okay? Okay? It's not wrong or right. It's just so. So, so I did that and taped them all together and I said, okay, let's wrap them around the equator, the widest point on the earth, about 24,850 miles on average. Okay? 
Slightly, we always say about 25,000 miles, okay? But I got the right number, and so I plugged it in so I could be real accurate with you folks, okay? Five quintillion. Will it wrap around the earth once at its widest point? This is the audience participation part. <laughs> Use the swag method, scientific wild-ass guessing, okay? Yeah, it'll wrap around it. And you keep wrapping it around it till you get a wall of money around the equator of the world, 8,000 feet high, mile and a half, solid wall of money. That's five quintillion. That represents how many transistors were put in things other than computers in 2015. And I was on a program with a cyber expert from the FBI just a few months ago, and he said this. At the FBI, our estimate is this. 99.8% of all things in the United States do not have cognition. They're not talking to each other. Get ready, folks. They're going to start talking to each other. And when they do, guess what? Here's the first thing that comes out of cognition. We know now these are all global positioned, right? Come on, folks. We didn't get our first Navistar, which was the global positioning system, renamed. We did not synthesize it to the point that it was usable till the year 2000. So now we've got global positioning what? That's real precise. So this is global positioned, right? It's global positioned, so guess what? And now things are talking to each other. So the single most valuable private company, according to Fortune magazine, is now which company? Uber. Uber. Uber handles more trips in a vehicle for hire than any company in the world. It came out of nowhere. Not a change in transportation, not a change out of Detroit, not a change in fuels, just what? A smart cognitive system that linked, that said what? You're driving back to Carroll, and I need a ride, and five bucks, and I bring the beer. You got a vehicle, I got a need, we match them, you get paid a little bit, paid a lot, doesn't matter, you with me folks? Single largest provider of transportation per hire without a single change in any technology in transportation, just a smart cognitive system. <laughs> and Marriott bought out Starwoods and proudly says what? We're the largest provider of hotel rooms in the world. Well, hotel rooms, yeah, but the largest provider of rooms for hire is whom? Airbnb. You know, I, you'll take me to Carroll, but you're an empty nester, so I'll spend the night with you. And that means I'll have to bring more beer, right? Yeah. Okay. You got a room, somebody needs one, match them up. book written two years ago, Changing Healthcare, and it was, the patient will see you now. If you need to go to a doctor, what? Go to a doctor? When's the last time you went to a doctor? And got in immediately. Hmm. Last time I went, I sat for an hour. Okay. And then got in a room, and they weighed me and said, oh, sweet Jesus. <laughs> and so did I. Uh, and then about another 30 minutes later. I'm not making light of the doctor. I'm just trying to tell you, guess what? The doctor's busy. You want him to spend time with you. But guess what? The doctor can come out of seeing one patient and punch one button and know that, guess what? In five minutes, you're five minutes away. So guess what? You can go about your life. The doctor can do what they do. And then they just do what? Say, guess what? I'll see you now. Okay? Get ready, folks. This changes everything. What about selling of livestock? What about procuring of inputs? Folks, get ready. You young generation, maybe some of you older people will guess what? Start matching them up. You got a co-op here in Iowa that does it. 
They do real-time weather data and say, well, guess what? I know I told you I'd be on your farm and put some anhydrous down tomorrow, but it's too wet. But you know what? Yours is 17 miles away, and it's not, and we've got real-time weather data, and you'll get better efficiency out of it. I'm going to go do yours, and you wait until I'm ready to do it and best for you, and you get 5% change. And, oh, by the way, you do do because you let me, you let me determine that with a smart system. Are you with me, folks? And by the same token, you harvest or sell animals or crops, and guess what? You overlay a smart system that know where unit trains are. Are you with me, folks? Get ready for a revolution. And get ready because of the cognition for, because 10 years ago when we said, oh, vehicles will drive themselves, those of us that studied the early forms of autonomous driving, what did we say? We said, oh, my God, that will take a cell tower every hundred yards, and, my God, we'll have to put sensors in the pavement. The cost, oh, my God, you can't do it. That's, that's two generations away. Nobody will ever see it. And then all of a sudden, because you have five quintillion transistors, all of a sudden, guess what? We have literally logged millions of miles of autonomous driving. So get ready for a revolution in waste pickup for your lagoon pools, for your hogs, because guess what? You may have to have several days or several months worth of it, but guess what? In an autonomous truck world, guess what? That truck comes, what, 24 hours a day and backs up to a robotic system and does what? Pulls out the day's waste and does what? Takes it to another location and it's not waste anymore. It's turned into what? Something else. Get ready for a revolution in waste management, the likes of which you've never seen because guess what? Google doesn't just want to provide you an autonomous car. The first industry they want is trucking. And as the founder of Uber says, if it moves, we want to be part of it. Oh, get ready, folks. Uber already supplies nurses in Boston for emergency room service. There's a whole bunch of nurses in, in Boston and a whole bunch of emergency rooms that need nursing staffs. And when one needs it because somebody's sick, guess what? An Uber system says what? You leave just three doors down, so guess what? You're hooked up for the night shift or the morning shift. Are you with me? Labor gets Uberized. Get ready, folks. Fabulous revolution because things can talk to each other. Okay? Okay? You put all of that together, though, folks, and it really means this. And some of you have seen about it, but I'll give you the acronym. It goes by large I, small O, or big T, or big E. The Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything. Everything's connected. It's not only talking to each other. Everything's connected. What I'm trying to tell you is this. Most of you already do it. We did it early on with radio frequency identification. Folks, sensors are now for all intents and purposes because of advances in material sciences. For all intents and purposes, we now just print out a smart sensor for less than a penny. There isn't going to be a corn plant, a corn seed, a soybean seed, or an animal, or a tree that's not going to have a transistor in it. We print them now for damn near nothing. Okay, Everything's going to be connected. Every damn corn plant you raise will talk to another one. Okay, And every pig you got, we're going to start gathering now. So be, be ready for this one. Okay, Because one, one of the gentlemen that coined the term virtual reality, his name is Jaron Lanier, the only reason I follow him much is he grew up in Las Cruces, New Mexico, where I lived, okay? One of those guys that just was a weird thinker but is hired by lots of companies and never went to college and he's just smart as hell, coined the word virtual reality. But he wrote a wonderful book and it's called Who Owns the Future? And his comment was in this world where everything has got sensors and we it's talking to each other, the people that own it are the aggregators. Facebook is worth billions of bucks because guess what? You give it free information. Doesn't pay for a damn bit of information. You provide it, and so guess what? They aggregate it and do what? So you make money in this new world where things talk to each other two ways. Aggregate it. You may need some help on that, National Iowa Pork, National Pork, 
may be ready to help you on that. Some co-ops, are you with me, folks? Private businesses already aggregate it, own it, or at least then, guess what? If I'm going to own the aggregation of your pig data and I want it 24 hours a day on all your pigs in every system you got, and if you're going to let me have that, then guess what? Don't give it away like Facebook. Make people pay you for it, okay? Because, folks, we're just starting this thing, and you've heard it, big data, okay? But what it means is, guess what? We're babes in the woods. We think we know how pigs act in an environment. Come on, folks, get ready. Get the data aggregated. Let me start helping you figure out how to do it and when and where. Are you with me, folks? Babes in the woods on it. And I guarantee you, for human health, same thing. They're fighting like crazy to get it for human health. Because guess what? 85% of all health care costs today for humans are behaviorally related, and we don't understand jack about your behavior. But you start getting that data aggregated, and we can start making better decisions about not only when an outbreak of a disease occurs, not just for humans, but what? Wouldn't you like to know that for some pretty nasty pig problems? Get ready, folks. This new world of everything talking gives us whole new tools, okay? Make sure people pay for that data some way or another, okay? Or start aggregating it, okay? The Internet of Things move us in ways you never dream possible, folks, okay? And in that world, you can damn sure bet that education gets turned on its end, too. Okay? Those of you involved in education in some way, guess what, folks? Oh, we have no idea what's going to happen. Let me leave with the final two. When you start getting the computer capacity infinite, and here's one that you, this is going to be the final one, okay? Robots, okay? Second largest buyer of industrial robots last year was which industry? Agriculture. Which industry in agriculture? Dairy. Robotic milkers, okay? We're getting where, guess what? The robots are real good. First robot, industrial robot, 1962. General Motors bought the first one to weld, okay? That car of 1970, how much of it was made by a robot? Less than 1%. Welded a little bit of the fenders and part of the frame, okay? Less than 1%. Today, the average car manufactured in America is 50% manufactured by robots. Right now in Japan, it's 75 percent, and Japan says in five years it'll be 100 percent. And they're the best in robotic technology in the world, so guess what? I'm betting on what? In five years, every car manufacturer in Japan is going to be what? A robot, and we'll be at about 75. Are you with me, folks? The robots are coming, okay? And they're getting so good that they become droid. See, the problem with robots is you, you don't want to be around those industrial robots because they don't know what a human is from a fender. So you might get your leg wed welded to the car, okay? okay? But, oh, the next generation of them, and get ready for this one. This one's called Baxter. It's human compatible, okay? Baxter is so sensitive, and it's using a technology invented by Disney Research that can tell a ripe peach from an unripe peach. And the one that Disney invented was so dexterous with one hand it can thread a needle. Can you do that with one hand? It can. So you sit next to Baxter, which looks like a robot, but looks like a human too, you with me? And you take its hand, and it learns you, and you take its hand and you put it on a ripe peach, and you show it which bucket to put it in, and you put it on an unripe peach, and show it which bucket to put it in, and you do it once, and it never forgets. In the pork industry, we have a little bit of a problem, don't we, on crates, and how the public perceives that we handle pigs by crates. But in a robotic system world, guess what? You get the best of the crates to save baby pigs' lives and a better life for the sow. Because robots can do that 24-7 and they don't get tired. Okay. Get ready for a revolution in robots, the likes of which you've never seen. Okay. And the final one. You, you've heard about it by many names, 3D printing, augmented printing, okay, ground-up printing. But when GE, the world's largest manufacturer of things, says that the future of GE is totally 3D printing, then get ready. You've got a revolution going on, okay? Everything's going to be printed, okay? The Chinese gave us a 3D printer about 
about the size of this. Industrial waste in one 24-hour period printed eight fully functioning modular homes. Two years ago, you saw the 3D printer at the Detroit Auto Show that took 44 hours, but it printed a car and drove it off the stage. We print everything, okay? That's not the revolution. It is a revolution in manufacturing, because guess what? That means manufacturing doesn't have to go where? Doesn't have to go offshore. It's what? You want to make a part for a jet fighter? Do it in your garage. What the hell, okay? It's already here. It's already here. So 3D printing changes everything, okay? But the 3D printing that impacts us in agriculture is what we call bionic or biological 3D printing. We got a million dollar Methuselah prize for the world's first printed liver. That if it's transferred into a large mammal and functions as a liver for 90 days, you claim the million dollar Methuselah prize. There's six sperms that are real close. We can print liver cells that will function as a liver, but livers need blood flowing from them. So the next revolution is using something called graphene, and you lay down that molecule of graphene along with a cell for a blood vessel, and you print it as well. And then, guess what? The blood vessels grow in the graphene that looks like chicken wire, and you have printed livers that function as a liver, and then you can put blood in them that's already here. And it's not going to be here soon enough for me. I need a new liver bath. I'm just teasing you. Okay? I'm just trying to tell you, guess what, though? But the revolution, of course, comes in what? On site, we print now what? An additive for your feed. We print a vaccine. Are you with me, folks? As soon as we get an outbreak because of big data, guess what? On your farm, on your business, you print it. And if you doubt that, guess what? Home Depot says that's what they want to be. They want you to come to Home Depot and do like I do, go into subhypnotic trance and buy another claw hammer. Okay. I counted them the other day. I have nine. Okay. Those are the ones I could find. Because okay. I found out it's far easier to buy one than to look for one. Okay. They want me to still do that. But Home Depot wants to make sure that they provide you that 3D printer at home and the instructions online and the raw material. So if you need a number 10 washer to fix the screen door, guess what? You don't drive to Home Depot, you do what? Print it. Okay. You're going to be everywhere. Get ready for a revolution. But the biggest revolution for us in agriculture is, guess what? If we can do it for vaccines and feed ingredients, uh, are we going to print food? And yeah, we already have, and you know that. Okay. The Dutch made printed hamburger meat two years ago, taste tested it in public in Great Britain, and all the people overwhelmingly concluded it tasted like crap. Okay. <laughs> but in this world, somebody's going to buy it. <laughs> Best time ever to be alive. Best time ever to be in agriculture. Thanks for letting me share part of your day. Thank you, Dr. Catlett. I think we got a little time for a few questions, if there's any questions up there. Comments? There might be questions and say, you don't believe a damn word you said. <laughs> Any comments? Yeah, I got that. Uh, yes, sir. Mark. I listened to you at the Core Brewers uh, quite some time ago, and you said we had enough technology to drive a self-driving car. Right. That was like 15 years ago. We still aren't there yet. Did I, did, did I do that? Yes, oh, you did. Well, we got it, so Mike. Why, are we, why, why do we have one? Because I, I still want to drive one, don't you? <laughs> no, actually, what well, the survey just found this, that... Fifty-seven percent of Americans right now say they would embrace a self-driving car immediately, okay? And 43 percent basically are like me. They kind of go, you know, I want that self-driving car when I'm at the bar, <laughs> and I don't want to drive home, okay? Uh, it's, it's a mixed bag right now. But, but God, I mean, Google has logged the last uh, number I saw, at least 9 million miles in self-driving cars, okay? One accident. And there will be accidents, you understand that. But the tech, not surely, you're right, you're right. It's, it's part of acceptance, too, because, my, you know, the trucking industry is already lined up to fight it, okay? Because you've got 1.8 million truck drivers. What the hell are you going to do with them? 
Okay. And I maintain they're going to be like the self-driving cars that we're doing right now. Is the technology is there to do it and do it very effectively. It's um, it's like, but we've been able to do that for airplanes. But I still like to think that there's a couple of pretty good pilots in that cockpit, don't you? And and so the truck drivers, what we're what we're seeing is we got to help in education to retrain them to be technicians because they may be technicians that just go along for making sure the load's done right. And and there's a blend right now among some pretty sharp people that basically say we'll never get to the point where computers are as good as in terms of thinking and everything else that humans do, but we're getting closer. But we make sure that in the cloud and big data that we have humans also interfacing with that big data to make them more powerful. Let me give you the best example of that, okay? It's Watson from IBM. Medical doctors now that are smart want to go first to Watson because Watson is real smart, okay? And Watson goes through and reads every journal article. And so Watson, so I can plug in the symptoms if I'm a medical doctor, and Watson goes through and said, but did you check this? Because we found in 3% of the population, guess what? This occurs when that occurs. And so smart medical doctors now are using Watson to not, to, to give them better what? Accuracy of diagnosis. So the first self-driving cars, they may still have a technician in them, just because guess what? We want them, okay? But boy, insurance companies are going to have to change some things, aren't they not? Okay, okay, get ready. Okay, but a, but a big big chunk of it is just do we accept them? And right now, I find it fun to double clutch and and you know speed every now and then and all that kind of stuff. You know? Not with a beer in my hand like I used to. Okay, okay. Peugeot actually now has one. 2015 model year, it came out over a year ago, that in the rear view mirror, it determines seven emotional states, okay? You get in a Peugeot 2015 model year, and it is real accurate, 95% accurate, and looking at you and determining seven of your emotional states. And if you get in and you're kind of melancholy, the reason it does that is it starts playing peppy music to try to get you out of being melancholy. And if you get in and you're mad, it won't start. And if you get in and your pupils are dilated, it calls the cops. <laughs> it can do that, okay? But all Peugeot wanted to do was to change your mood with music, which we know humans respond to, okay? The 2017 model year, which will come out fairly soon, has aromatherapy in it. They'll play music for your mood and then squirt perfume on your rear end when you get out, I guess. I don't know. Okay, okay. okay. And, you know, and it, they're out. You can buy them. But uh, according to the last thing I could get out of Peugeot, they're not been very successful. Nobody really wanted them. You know, it's like they want to play the damn music they want to. If I'm melancholy, I want to play some country western sad music and lose my damn dog for the third time. You know, I want to just enhance my melancholy mood. Damn it. Yeah. So, in any event, it, it's 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 there. It's just a matter of acceptance. And nobody's going to ask another question because they go, hell, you went off on 14 tangents. <laughs> and it took you 10, 20 minutes to get that far, so shut up. So anyway, it's there. And you know that. You've seen it. You know, you don't have to Google, Google autonomous cars and you're going to find it. Come on, how long have we had ones that'll, that'll parallel park for you? Come on. That's been around for what, nine years now or something like that? So, yeah. yeah. I'm not going to spend any extra to buy one, trust me. Okay. I like to drive still. Okay. But I'm old. But when I can't drive anymore? And I don't want, here's, here's the thing when I started out about agriculture owns the natural world for, for carbon. We also own the natural world for people that are getting older. Because guess what? If you don't spend your last days, the, the growth in assisted care facilities are not in r urban areas. They're in rural areas. If I'm going to spend my last time on earth, I want to spend it where I can see a wheat field, a cornfield, or have a dog or a cat or something around me. And agriculture owns that. There's now 300. The trend now is away from golf courses being the center of where developments are. And the trend is now for what? Over 300 of them at last count. A farm is the center of it. And you build your home around them not so you can golf. 
but so that you can go see corn grow and pick some sweet corn. Okay. Okay. That's where I want to be. And if I'm, too, if I'm going to need that facility, I'm probably not going to drive to it. How about an autonomous car that will take me there? And then when I need to go to the liquor store, it will take me to the liquor store. <laughs> Other comments? You've been great. Thanks for letting me come home. I appreciate it, folks.